uh, heartened that the government is paying attention to this issue and harnessing the whole of government, whole of society to deal with this ongoing concern. I have a further question for the Minister. Why I appreciate the efforts uh, that are targeted primarily at the low-income Singaporeans to cope with the increased cost of living. I would like to ask the Minister, what more can the government do to help the sandwich the middle class, the middle income group? This group are unlikely to qualify for most of the schemes or the subsidies are always often tiered lower due to their higher income. And understandably, they do aspire to live well and they also want to have better lifestyle, whether it's wants or needs. Uh, so, and they are, seeing, they, are, they are feeling that the household expenditures are also rising as their financial commitments increases. So I would like to ask the Minister, how can the government help this group deal with the money not enough uh, cost pressure that they are, they are facing? Mr. Speaker, sir, I thank Mr. Liang Eng Hua for his supplementary question. Let me first make a clarification. I think the government is concerned not just with the lower income, and that's the reason why I've asked MTI and the various agencies to look across the entire spectrum of families in Singapore, retirees, middle income groups, because they are all face different pressures. Of course, as a general policy, we try to do more for those with, from the lower income and perhaps the retirees first. Having said that, the government is very aware of the aspirations and the needs of the middle income groups. That's why we have a broad based swath of measures that I've alluded to to help everyone in Singapore. But specifically for the middle income groups, there are also various schemes that the government will extend to help them. It may not be in the same quantum as the lower income group, but generally they do get some different forms of help and different tiers of help. If members might recall that once upon a time when I was in MSF, I show everyone a chart, a diagram, which is now euphemistically known as the Kue Lapis chart, that we try to help everyone in Singapore by making sure that those with the least get the most. But that doesn't mean that those with more did not get anything. It's just a tiering of the different help schemes that they have. So for many of the middle income, I think their concerns will be the education for their children and perhaps the utilities bill that they have to face. And also many of them will be taking care of their elderly parents as well. We are clearly, we are very aware of this. And the way we do this to help them is as follows. First, we try to do as much as we can to take care of our seniors, to relieve the burden from the middle income household with elderly parents. Number two, we want to make sure that the children's educations remain affordable and everyone will have similar opportunities to excel and to fulfill their potential. Our promise as a government is that so long as someone is capable and committed, they should not need to have to worry about their means, their family circumstances. And that's why we give out as many scholarships as possible, bursary awards as possible to help our students <coughs> excel. So by reviewing by relieving the pressures from the older folks and the younger folks, we hope to relieve the pressures on the middle income, middle age families. And I would like to add one more point. Beyond looking at the averages, I myself have personally asked my staff to look at each of the decile bands. Because while our averages are moving up, we are obviously conscious that not everyone will move up at the same pace or the same rate and we will have to pay particular attention to the group that I mentioned just now who have lower wage increases or stagnating wage increases because their industries are going through rapid transformation. And this is where we will work closely with MOM and NTUC to help our workers transit to new industry, to acquire new skills, take on new jobs before they are displaced. And finally, maybe I'd just like to share a story that my grandmother used to tell me, I mean, members would probably know that I come from a single parent family, so my mother has to work two jobs when we were young, so I was brought up by my maternal grandmother. There are three things that I always remember her teaching me about managing our family finances. First, she always reminded me that I must get a good job. I must make sure that I earn 
enough to take care of the family. It's a reminder to urge us to study hard, to acquire the correct skills, and that so long as we are prepared to work hard, there will be an opportunity in Singapore for us to succeed. And this is also the same philosophy and commitment that I bring with me to MTI, NTUC, and MSF, that we must help our workers first and foremost to have those opportunities to realize their aspirations and ambitions. The second lesson that my grandmother always drummed into us is that we should aim high. And Singaporeans, like all of us here, it's not a sin to aim high. We should all aim high, but yet at the same time, we must know our own strengths and weaknesses so that we do not stress ourselves or overs overly stress ourselves and our families. We must know where our capabilities are, what we are good at. But as we aim high, we must also be realistic in how we achieve those ambitions. The Chinese say, si ke er zi, knowing our own limits. <coughs> but the third thing that my grandmother always reminded me was that regardless of our family circumstances, we must always have a care for those who are less fortunate than us and who may need a bit more help than us. During my time, I never knew that there was something called MPS to go and see MP. We didn't have SSOs. We had fully Pu or Hock Lei Po. But I was always reminded that that is really for those who really, really need help and that we should always try to take care of ourselves and at the same time take care of other people. And I think these three rules is quite instructive in how we approach this issue of uh, cost of living. First, I think we must make sure that every Singaporean have good jobs that can allow them to fulfill their potential. Second, we must help Singaporeans to stretch their hard-earned dollars that while in pursuing their ambitions and aspirations, that we are also realistic about our options and how we should distinguish the needs and the wants so that our families can have a better quality of life that is sustainable. Last but not least, with the resources that we have, either as a family or as a society, we must make sure that we give the most help to those who need it a bit more than us. Engineer Libiwa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. Thanks, Minister, for your very inspiring sharing of your stories. I have three supplementary questions. I would like to ask, Minister, the item on the food price, how is it uh, being computed? Because it shows that there's a declining from 2007 until 2017. Uh, but then, if you were to look at the price at a coffee shop, definitely that is not a trend. Second question, I have residents who keep telling me that uh, food in some of the coffee shops has gone up even before the effect of uh, water, in water price increase or electricity tariff increase. And each increase in the food price now is a lot, 50 cents, from $3 to $3.50, from 3 50 to $4. Unlike previously, increase is 10 cents or 20 cents. So I would like to ask Minister, will your ministry set up a committee to look into anti-profiteering. Please don't ask my resident to go to case because it affects all Singaporeans. Third question, I also got a feedback from residents because in Nisun South, we have NTUC, we also have Seng Siong. And I heard from residents that giving due respect to our colleague, my, my Mr. Sia Kim Ping, and those who, in NTUC, the food or the price of those Things so in NTUC nowadays are uh, not necessary, it's cheapest. So I would like to urge Minister to look into this. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the members. For the, it's actually a valuable opportunity for me to clarify some things. I will speak on. I won't speak on behalf of NTUC Fair Price. I'll share my experience as a previous and immediate past NTUC second gen. And I think this is uh, important. Let me first share on the charts first. Uh, the way to read the chart is that it's not that the food prices is decreasing. The rate of increase has come down. These are the rates of increase. The one I think you saw is a second chart, right? That means the food prices are still increasing, but the rate has come down from what used to be 3.3% to 2.1% to 1.4%. It is an increase, but a slower rate of increase. Part of it, it could be, okay, then how does this, is this computed? 
That's why I mentioned at the beginning of my speech, some of the food items and the prices will have a disproportionate impact because in our psychological perception, because we use it every day. So for example, coffee prices at coffee shops will be one very clear indicator. But in the overall basket of goods, coffee prices is but one item in the basket of goods. So how a basket of goods is constituted statistically is by the spending pattern of the different household types and different household types have different basket of goods. So the first clarification is that it's not that the prices are not increasing, but they are increasing at a different rate and it also depends on the basket of goods. So if you look at the charts, for example, in the top chart, that's why we have broken it down into the bottom 20%, middle 60% and top 20%. Each of the three groups, including the retiree household, also have a different basket of goods because their consumption patterns are different. So that's the first thing. The second thing, whether we will set up the anti-profiteering committee, I have thought long and hard about this thing, and we have previous experiences on how to be more effective, which is why in the number seven strategy, I propose to do things a bit differently to give us better result and faster result. You see, if you set up a committee to go and look at coffee price in one coffee shop, and you look up, then there will be many of these cases, the speed is not just fast enough and you ask a committee to go and decide whether the price is fair or not, it's also actually quite difficult. But today, actually, we have a better platform that can do this for us. Today, actually, with a lot of the crowdsourcing platforms, actually, when people put their prices down there, you can do an instant comparison. And I think this is even more effective in deterring those merchants that may be pricing their goods unfairly. So, for example, in Ishun, our favourite constituency, supposing we can set up an area to tell people where in Ishun is the cheapest coffee, the cheapest kaya toast, uh, and if your people can access the information easily, and people can freely put and make available the prices that they are offering in Ishun, then I think it will help consumers to stretch their hard-earned dollars, and it will be a much faster process than trying to submit a coffee price increase to someone else and come back later in that process. And in this open and transparent platform, I think it will also help to deter those people who may want to price their products uh, that is out of the norm. So this is why I asked to work with NTUC and CASE to proliferate or promote this platform so that we can get a faster response time. Surely, as you say, you don't want to, for one coffee shop, then we send to CASE, then wait for two weeks and come back with the result. That won't be very useful. And you also want a certain deterrence effect that people do not spread false rumours, like for example what you have suggested. Some people say that I'm increasing my price because of the GST hikes, but the GST hikes is not even coming in for a few years' time. So that's obviously not the right reason that they are doing what they are doing. So I hope that through such open platform and open sharing, we can have a faster response to some of these ground issues. Last but not least, I hope not, I am not stealing the thunder from Kempeng, uh, member Mr. Sia Kempeng. Uh, this is a common question that I've always been asked. That why is it that once in a while, the NTUC as a social enterprise have other people who beat their prices? Now, on behalf of Kempeng, from what I understood from him, NTUC actually has a basket of 500 items. And NTUC Fair Price monitor the 500 items every day. Their own 500 items and what the market is selling. And they will make sure that on average, their 500 items will be 4 5% below the whole basket of goods. But that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that every item is four or five percent below the the NTUC, uh, I mean below the market price. Now on the other hand, if we study marketing, we will also know that from part of the sales and strategy, it is in it is in my interest as the competitor to NTUC to make sure that every day I have a few items below NTUC prices in order to attract people to go there. Because when you go there, you don't just buy that few items as under discount. So this is actually quite common in the FMCG or fast-moving consumer goods market. Now, of course, having said that, I'm quite sure NTUC Fair Price will be very, working very hard to source from multiple agencies to try and reduce the prices, including the recent efforts on the milk powder, the number of house brands that they continue to expand their products, and so forth. So I think that is the commitment to NTUC. And one very interesting question that I've always pondered in my mind is not so much as whether Sing Song or Dairy Farm 
uh, is able to meet NTUC prices and beat NTUC prices. The question is that if we don't have social enterprises to benchmark some of these things, would the other competitors still charge those prices? That was actually the story of the welcome supermarket in the 1970s. It's not that they just meet NTUC prices or try to beat NTUC prices once in a while, that it was to, because of the benchmark. And this is not just groceries. Today, NTUC in the sector of elder care, early childhood education also perform the same role, which is they help and work with the ministries to understand the benchmark and the drivers for those services. And because of that, the entire market is, has an anchor point, if you like, in their pricing strategy and will not be carried away with just a price competition. Mr. Saktiandi. Thank you, Minister, for your comprehensive uh, explanation earlier with the charts. I just have one quick question in terms of um, uh, the impact of uh, economic forces such as the interest rate, uh, interest rate outlook uh, going forward. What would be Minister's view about that? Because with the Fed uh, probably raising rates, um, it would have impact on Singaporeans in terms of cash outlay in the future and what's probably the transmission mechanism, taking into consideration the fact that we are a change rate policy regime, but what would be the impact of the interest rate uh, outlook going forward and uh, impact on Singaporeans? Thanks. Uh, thank you for the supplementary questions. Yes. Let me answer this question the following way. Uh, yesterday, when we talked about the impact of the trade wars, I briefly mentioned this. So likewise, for any interest rate hikes across the global markets, I think there's the direct and indirect impact. The direct impact is, of course, it adds to the cost of doing business. And the second impact is that, of course, it will affect the relative exchange rates which will then affect our, the strength of the Sing dollar to, import, uh, to, have, to contain imported inflation. But the most important third level impact of any interest rate hikes across the world is the impact on the global business confidence. Because if, because of the trade wars and because of the interest rate hike, that it leads to an overall dampening of the global confidence level and people's investment, then what affects us most severely in, is the job creations. And if we cannot continue to create good jobs for our people, the rest of all these other help schemes are actually secondary. Because we first and foremost must have good jobs for our people, our economy grows, our people have jobs, and we have the means to help each other by redistributing some of the gains from this entire economic system. But if the economy shrinks, because of the downturn in global com market confidence, then I think it's a great, uh, there's a significant impact. So there's three levels of impact. The direct interest rate cost that you mentioned on business, the impact on the exchange rate, which affects our ability to contain imported inflation. Third, and most importantly, together with the headwinds that we face on the global trading environment, how it affects our economy and our ability to continue to create good jobs for our people to earn good incomes. Mr. Sia Kemping. I um, thank the Minister and former Secretary-General uh, for, for his answers. I, I just have a few uh, questions for him. I think, I, indeed, cost of living is a, is a big issue, and the eight-prong uh, approach that he has outlined, the strategies, I think are all very important. One. I just want to uh, say that, in addition, I think one key aspect in how uh, perhaps it's within the aid, but I didn't hear it, is about consumer education. Consumer education, I think, frankly, I think all of us know that eating in is a lot cheaper than eating out, wherever you may go. So, so things like that may be simple tips, but I think it's useful tips, which I, I think could be incorporated within the eight tips that you have. Uh, and, and speaking as an employer too, I think the cost of doing business is indeed something which uh, needs to be addressed. I know Minister has outlined some of them. Uh, in the case of uh, at least my, uh, my business, the NTC Fair Price is in, labour, rent and utilities. These are the three biggest cost levers. Uh, and, and government, I, I think on utilities, I think we all look forward to the opening up of the electricity market. So that will help all businesses and individuals alike. But I think on the part of labour and rent, I think these are areas which government is in a, position to see how it can continue to, to, to effect uh, a, a, a dampening of that. Um, I, I won't go into our, our, during tea, I will explain to engineer Li Bihua on some of the things. I, I'll fill her in on other details. 
Uh, and, and my final point is that I, I wearing the hat, uh, again, declaring my interest as uh, CEO of, of uh, NTC Fairprice and also uh, part of the NTC Enterprise Network. I think your eighth strategy about leveraging on social enterprises, this is something that the NTC group and the NTC Enterprises will be certainly keen to work uh, to, and to play a part in seeing how, as a group, we can address this very important issue for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sia, for your questions and comments. Uh, first, consumer education is my strategy number seven. That's why uh, we work closely with CASE to enable consumer choices. Now, uh, let me say this. We are not here to judge whether somebody should buy this or buy that and what should be necessary for your particular lifestyle. I mean, if you can afford it, you want to do it, uh, by all means. But I think our job is to enable consumer choice through consumer education. So I take the recent example of a case uh, of the milk powder. Actually, uh, personally, I was the one who sent Kenping. I think he still had the photo of one day when I was uh, shopping at NTUC Fair Price. I was very perturbed because when I walked down the food house, the only food item, a single item that cost more than $100 for some of the products was milk powder. And I was very intrigued. Why is it that there are milk powder that cost $30, same size, uh, same volume, that cost $30 something dollars, $80 something dollars, and $120? I took the photo, I sent it to Kimping, and I asked him, which is the most popular brand? That means if you, from sales. It was the $80 on average brand. And I was very puzzled. What's the difference between the $30 brand, the $80 brand, and the $120 brand. So the $120 brand was because of some ingredients that uh, the children might be allergic to, and that's why there's a special formulation, so I can understand. But then what about the $30 versus the $80 brand? And I asked Yen Peng if he could bring in the th more of the $30 brand. And his answer was also quite telling. They have tried before, but it didn't sell well. Uh, why? Because maybe some consumers and maybe parents like us will always want the best for our children and we wonder, should we sting on that 50 extra dollar for one can of milk powder? What if there are real benefits which my child is not getting? And we can understand that kind of psychology. But over time, I think through consumer education, we have been able to expand the market share of the $30 plus brand, including some of the house brands that NTUC Fairprice has brought in. But today, if I'm not wrong, the $80 plus brand is still the most popular range segment. And that shows that it has come down, but it's still quite high. And that shows that actually all of us can play our part to assure family members of the quality of the products. And NTUC has a lot of house brands, but again, I, when I was in SecGen, NTUC, they don't always sell, they wouldn't always sell the most, or the, being the most popular brand. But it's okay. So long as we have a variety of choices for our consumers, I think we let them choose within their means to see what best suits their family needs. So the you know, consumer education is very important. We agree on your sec with your second point that utilities, rents and labour will of course be concerns for the businesses, which is why we are extending the opening of the open electricity market to more retailers, I mean to more consumers and small businesses. And for rents, as I've mentioned, we will closely monitor the trend to make sure that the rents do not spike up because of insufficient uh, space for our businesses to do their business. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we thank NTUC Enterprises for continuing to show leadership in the pricing of its many products and services beyond groceries today, including healthcare, elder care, and also uh, childcare. Mr. Lim Biao Chuan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Actually, this is a point of privilege because uh, case was mentioned. I was hoping that Minister Chan would also say something about case, but he only defended NTUC fair price. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if, I, if I may just clarify for uh, the Honourable uh, Member for Yishun, uh, to provide feedback, you do not need to be a member of case. You only need to be a member of case if you want case to, be, uh, to represent the consumer to liaise with business. On the point by uh, the member, uh, Dr. Engineer Dr. Li Biwa, uh, that complaining to case has no effect because price. Okay, <laughs> that that you know you, you don't want uh, the consumer to go to case because price have gone up. The reality, uh, as um, Minister Chan has mentioned, which is that every business has different 
price pressure. So their rental may be more expensive because they are in better locality. They, they may have to pay more for their staff. So Case finds it very difficult really to be able to um, decide which business is uh, profiteering because they set higher prices. But Case will be happy to work with MTI to try to provide better transparency so that our consumers will be able to know what businesses provide best value to consumers. So thank you, Mr. Speaker, for allowing me to raise that clarification on behalf of CASE. Engineer Libiwa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. I didn't say that it's not effective handled by CASE. What I meant is that the cost of living or, or, or the profiteering issue affect every Singaporean. We don't want every Singaporean to go to CASE. Same as we don't want every old by uh, victims to go to case because they'll be flooded by all these cases. We would like the ministry to set up a committee to look into specific cases because one store increased 50 cents, next day another store also increased 50 cents. It has its chain effect. Thank you. Engineer Lee Biwa can settle with Mr. Sia and Mr. Lim later at tea. Mr. Yi Chia Sien. Thank you, Speaker, sir. Uh, to, to the uh, Minister for Trade and Industry, uh, I highlight the, this rental again. Uh, I brought this issue up during the opening of the second session of this parliament. I think a lot of businesses, because they sign short leases of three years, and every time it, the lease is due for renewal, they face a big uh, surprise from the landlord saying the, the rental going forward will increase by a huge amount. And uh, if they don't renew, they have to reinstate and the landlord is actually using this uh, friction of uh, uh, having to incur reinstatement costs to their advantage. And all this actually feeds to the cost of living because uh, you know, the, the businesses suffer the higher costs of the, on renewal, the, the rental rates, and because of that, they have to charge higher. So I hope uh, MTI will really look into my suggestions of having longer lease periods as well as mandating that the uh, landlords should not put the reinstatement clause uh, into all their tenancy contracts. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, sir, uh, just two comments in response to Member Engineer Li Bihua and Member Itia Singh's comment. Uh, first, on the issue of the leases, I think we can't mandate the length of the leases uh, because it's a commercial decision between the commercial entity renting out the place and the one taking the thing. Well, I, we accept the point, and I think you have made the point during the COS that the contract must be fair, must be fair to both sides. Uh, and I think that is something that we will certainly encourage and look into. But I think we can't mandate every lease to be of a certain length because I think the businesses also require certain flexibilities because of their different business models. Uh, on, mis uh, on the other issue, I'd just like to reassure uh, Member Li Bihua that when there are issues that have to deal with uh, anti-competitive behaviour, then uh, MTI, together with uh, CCCS, the, will make sure we take it up as a consumer and competition commission. We will take this up. Uh, but in all the things, we will have to strike a balance between protecting the consumer and facilitating the business and especially innovative practices, especially in current era whereby there's a proliferation of new business models, including the ones that you mentioned. We will have to strike that right balance to make sure that we protect our consumers and yet at the same time, uh, not stifle innovative practices. And we have to find a balancing point as we continue to go along. Mr. Leon Pereira. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I thank uh, Minister Chan for his explanation. Just one uh, supplementary question. Would MTI consider uh, measuring and publishing the CPI based on different demographic groups? I, I know it is published based on income group, but there could be other demographic groups, such as the three groups where the government has presented its measures, for example, for example, young couples, uh, parents with young children and uh, retirees, would uh, the government consider you know, publishing the CPI based on these groups? Because there could be uh, certain factors, for example, price of milk powder could be one example, which affects certain groups by demographic characteristic rather than just by income characteristic, and that may enable us to have more well-informed debates about policy. Thank you. So, Speaker, so actually, NPI already does that. Um, so, as you can see from the charts, uh, we do have uh, various ways to look at the data differently. So, one dimension would be by income, the bottom 20th percentile, the middle 60th, and the top 
20th percentile. So there's one dimension. The other dimension that you mentioned, like for example, retirees, because uh, they generally have either fixed or uh, no income and they are living on their savings, but we are particularly concerned. And that's why over the last five years, uh, MTI has started uh, monitoring this data, but it takes us some time to build up by different demographic groups and we'll make available those data when we have them.